Hello, everybody. And Hello. Welcome to Breaking Story with Young Screenwriters. We are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. Uh, I'm Alexi. And I'm Adam. And, and that's Adam. And today we are talking about setups and payoffs. And we're also going to be looking at decision to leave um, the romance murder mystery film <laughs> as an example a little bit later. But first, we're going to start off kind of talking more broadly about setups and payoffs. And uh, it's important to when we're discussing and explaining and, you know, going over setups and payoffs and how that applies to screenwriting. Um, a really foundational idea um, is Chekhov's gun, an understanding of what that is and how to actually best apply that into your screenplay in a meaningful way, not just, you know, oh my God, I put something up in act one, I have to pay it off in act three. Like, what does that actually look like? And how do you make that matter to the audience? Um, so Alexi, how would you define Chekhov's gun? So I always confuse Chekhov's gun and Hitchcock's bomb. Oh yeah, we could talk but, about both of those, but. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're pretty similar. Um, basically, I think it originally was advice for playwrights um, from some Russian guy. Chekhov. And there we go, Chekhov. Some Russian guy named Chekhov. And good old Chekhov, I believe said like, Basically, if you're going to put a loaded gun in one scene, it needs to go off at the end of the film. Um, so if you're going to introduce a concept with implied consequences, we need to see those consequences play out later on in the story. Um, similarly, the bomb, Hitchcock's bomb. Adam, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so that's more of, um, that's more of at the scene level of how to create suspense, right? Which is a little different than setups and payoffs, but um, Hitchcock's got bomb theory is if you have a character, have two characters having dinner together and you film it one way where you watch the conversation, it plays out and then boom, there's a bomb goes off and they both die. You get a surface level surprise. You get a reaction from the audience, but uh, Hitchcock argued that it was a very shallow um, reaction. It's the one surprise at the end of the scene uh the shocks the audience he argued that a more meaningful way to frame that exact same scene is to start the scene by showing the bomb under the table and then go back to the conversation between the two people that would completely recontextualize or give a different meaning to the scene entirely from an audience point of view instead of watching the conversation and then having a one-time surprise you are dreading the yeah. bomb going off. You're like, please, what are you guys doing? Get out, go. You're like the audience is emotionally involved in what's happening on a deeper level than um, they would be otherwise. Now that's uh, more of like how to take a scene and think about, okay, what is the piece of in information that can create tension? How do I push conflict? What am I showing the audience? And what am I withholding from the audience? to create more conflict, not just conflict between the characters and the situation, but conflict from the audience's perception of the film. Um, and you could look at Chekhov's gun as a different type of conflict. It's a ticking bomb you set up at the beginning of the film that the audience ideally will forget about, right? Right. Or wonder about and uh, be happy to see um, the promise cool. paid off. It's a promise you've made to the audience. You put the gun in the drawer in act one. The gun has to go off in act three. It, but it also does, doesn't have to be in that cadence. It can be act two to act three. It can be act two to act two. But generally speaking, the longer the distance between the setup and the payoff, um, the more meaningful it is because the audience will have the surprise and joy of, an, oh my God, this inevitable thing that I knew about, but I forgot is coming back to me and we're seeing it pay off now in the present tense yeah and you know it's also really connected to things like our trust in the in the storyteller in the writer right like now anyway when we as like experienced story absorbers and like people who have been told a lot of stories too 
there's an expectation that's kind of evolved with this idea of Chekhov's gun, where it's like, if, if you show me a gun in the beginning of the film, I, as an experienced viewer, now expect that something is going to happen with it. It's, it's like that trust that has developed between storyteller and the person receiving it, that I'm not going to give you random details um, that don't matter. Like if I'm telling you something, if I'm spending time concentrating on it, then it matters. And that's that's kind of like a another side of Chekhov's gun. That like not only is it tight storytelling to make sure that it matters, there's an expectation now that it does. And I think that that's more true in screenwriting than most other mediums. Um, so, and I think uh, one thing that people don't talk about that much is there are different types of callbacks. There are different types of payoffs, right? There are emotional relationship oriented payoffs like that are about like a shared moment or memory or piece of dialogue that comes back that's recontextualized. And then there are the physical plot device. Like, so I would say there's like a physical Chekhov's gun and there's an emotional one that's centered around characters and their subjective experience, right? So um, going to a great example of uh, the quiet in The Quiet Place, you set up that the hearing aid um, is being used in act one. And at the end, the sound of the hearing aid is paid off to be detrimental to the aliens and it hurts them. Um, it's that's a very physical act. You you've shown that the hearing aid can do something in the beginning or that it exists, that it's, that it's a, that it's a phenomena that you're, and we forget about it until it matters later. And, uh, a more emotional Chekhov's gun, uh, in the film, uh, decision to leave. There's this really powerful moment that happens around the midpoint where, um, protagonist, says to uh forget, so ray she says to her you know basically you've broken me um but i'm gonna help you out with this and he tells her um take the phone to the sea someplace deep where nobody can find it and he tells her this and we as the audience have no idea that those words are going to mean something different at the end of the film at that moment we just think Oh wow, he's she's she's got to throw that phone away. That has that has the evidence that she was complicit in a murder. He's gonna destroy himself and his his uh, ethical, you know, moral framework to help her escape, to help her discard the phone, throw it into the sea where no one can find it. At the end, she spoiler for decision to leave. At the end, she herself throws herself into the sea where no one can find her, specifically him. And the last shot of the film is him on top of where she's been buried under the sea, where the, the water has drowned her, and he has no idea that she's right below him. Um, and this sort of plays into the sense of, like, he solved, he's a problem solver, he's loved to solve murders, um, and she has become an unsolvable murder. Like, the, the phone, when he hands it to her to throw it away, it's his way of, I'm going to make your murder, and the, the murder of your husband an unsolved murder, and she herself became an unsolved murder for him. So... But that idea that the line of throw this phone away to the bottom of the sea where no one can find it, that's an emotional setup that pays off later. That's, it's, I, it's, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a Chekhov's gun, but it is, it's an emotional setup that will become inevitable in retrospect. Um, right. And screenwriters should really pay attention to what are the things characters say to each other early on in a film that matter and how can they have meaning later? How can this sort of rhyme repeat? What are, what are the sort of, associations that give stories and endings specifically to stories their power one of my favorite things in scripts and in storytelling in general is when there's a phrase that means one thing at the very beginning of a film and then means something like basically completely opposite at the end and of course i'm coming up short on other examples right now but i love that because we talk a lot about i mean this is a little bit of a tangent but we talk a lot about how you know your character should do something at the end of the film that they would never, ever do at the beginning. And I love when we've set up that specific thing in the beginning in, yeah. a, in like a subtle way. Um, oh, here's an example. Mm -hmm. um, in Toy Story, Woody t tells Buzz Lightyear, that's not flying, that's falling with style in act one. And he right. means it based on his flaw, like he's skeptical of it. He doesn't want to accept Buzz into his into his life um, or as an equal 
or share anything with him. He wants, he buzzes a threat to him. But in act three, he, those same words are recontextualized when they've come together, when they have a friendship. And he not only is accepts buzz as a friend, but as someone he wants to share his love with, um, his love of Andy with. And when he says, um, we're flying, we're flying, buzz says the words that what he said back to him, which is, I'm not flying, I'm just following the style. That in a way is an emotional setup um, that corresponds to the act one flaw and the transformation into the act three inner need. It's the words that meant something, the words have changed meaning because of the journey the characters had and sort of coming back that. to those words has power. Um, I'm a sucker for that. That's, that's like- great. I love mm, that stuff too. We all do. Kiss. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. So here's a good question. When, how do you decide between a Chekhov's gun and a red herring? Like, are red herrings bad? Are they? Yes. So they're different in the sense a Chekhov's gun is a either a plot promise or an emotional promise um, that is invisible to the audience when they first receive it. It's a piece of information, either something the character has said or something we, the audience, see. Whether it's I put the gun in the drawer or that's. That's not flying, that's falling with style, you know, or take this phone and throw it to the bottom of the sea, right? Those are all different setups, all information. But the first time the audience hears that, they're just on the ride. Chekhov's gun is the mechanism where you connect that piece of information, that moment, back to the end or later in the story meaningfully. A red herring is a misdirection to the audience, ideally. It's a mm. misdirection on from the from the Chekhov's guns, right? It's it's something to throw the audience off their scent. And I think there's a bad version of a red herring, and then there's a good version of a red herring. A good version of a red herring feels like it's part of the story, and at the end, you don't feel angry about like thinking right. it was important, <laughs> right? It, yeah. It's a misdirection that doesn't call attention to itself. Whereas a bad red herring is like you see this in murder mysteries all the time. It's like, you know, let's just say in this in this hypothetical story, the husband killed his wife, right? And the writers are so afraid that you're going to guess that the husband killed his wife. They're going to spend 30 minutes of the story following around this little boy and his bicycle, and the little boy probably did it. And we're going to follow all the leads about that. Like, if the plot yeah. sort of is fully designed around this sort of direction that in it at the end becomes completely irrelevant and meaningless. Like the audience doesn't want to feel like, wait, you could have just cut 30 minutes out of the movie and it wouldn't have mattered. Like a good misdirection yeah. feels like it's part of the same story. Right. I agree with that. It's like, I don't want to feel like I've just been led down a dead end. I want to feel like I've been led down like a tangential branch that's still yes. getting me kind of in that direction that I want to go, but I'm not quite on the right track yet. So like I'm honing in on the answer versus just completely shooting off into the abyss. I wouldn't have had to watch that if like, you know, there's no reason I had to watch that necessarily. That's so would you say that a, a red herring in a way is like a Chekhov's gun that is intentionally placed that doesn't pay off is i wouldn't i wouldn't define it that way i think a Chekhov's okay. gun is defined by the fact that it pays off right mr yeah. mr misdirections red herrings i think they're more like it's information you place to distract the audience from the plot or from the from the mechanisms of the plot right it's right. the it's the information that feels really important and is convincing that doesn't that feels feels connected to the overall story but is distracting you from what's really going on uh, emotionally um and th th these yeah. this language comes a lot from murder mysteries but it can be used in any type of story um, and i suppose in a way it's like a red herring as it's most commonly used kind of refers to the past right like usually it like refers to like i think that this is the reason that something already happened or the audience right. thinking, oh, that didn't matter. Yeah. It's like, it's like they, it's the false belief that something is 
like the cause or the reason for something that already happened. Whereas a Chekhov's gun is more looking to the future. Right. And, and like, it does matter. Right. Like yeah. red herrings don't matter. There's information that's presented like it does matter, but doesn't really in the same way. Um, a Chekhov's gun always is, it always matters. It always, it's a setup that must pay off. It's the gun in the drawer must go off. The red herring is, Oh, maybe it's the little boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, He's you know, got, his bike is very suspicious. It's it's interesting how like as time has gone on, our expectations about Chekhov's guns and things like that have become, I guess, different than when it was originally said. Like now it's almost boring and expected if you literally put a gun in a scene and then like have it go off later. Well, that's why it's really important to put distance, right? It's a well, that... layered events happening. So you don't feel like so many bad movies will show the setup and then three scene la scenes later, the thing happens. And you're like, well, of course, it of course, that's so obvious, right? It's the more time you put between um, the setup and the payoff, the more interesting stuff you put in between it uh, gives the audience enough time for to be surprised by the inevitable. Right. Right. And but I also, I also feel like we now expect a subversion, like where it's not going to be used in the way that's most mm -hmm. obvious. Right. Like, you know, and ex what is that name of that one? The murder satire film. It's three. It's the same word three times. With the machete. The machete champagne. Um, machete. Who's in it? Oh, my God. Pete. Pete Davidson. Oh, oh, bodies, bodies, bodies. Body, yeah. See, see, yeah. I, I that was a pretty good description that I gave. That was, I, that was. I, it was just, yeah. I needed a face. <laughs> <laughs> so bodies, bodies, bodies. You have a Chekhov's gun with the machete. Spoilers. Yeah. Spoilers for the next, like, 30 seconds. You have a Chekhov's gun where we see this machete at the beginning. And he's trying to cut the top off the bottle, off a champagne bottle uh, with with the machete and then he ends up being dead and we end up circling back we find a video on his phone where that's how he had killed himself was uh he chopped himself with a machete trying to take the top off a champagne bottle um and there was no murderer the whole time end of spoiler but that that yeah, isn't spoiled the whole the whole movie <laughs> hey i did say i said i'm gonna do it the next 30 seconds see but that's a that's a, that's a great reveal that feels inevitable in retrospect is well it doesn't necessarily feel inevitable i forget exact how they set that up in the movie but it's an explanation that you wouldn't readily reach for right um and i feel like we're very much talking about murder mysteries uh and mysteries in general with this language it's hard not to because like the whole idea of a red herring came about from that right but um it's it's basically i think what's important for no matter what you're writing to know what is the audience experience of the story? Not just like your point of view as a writer being like, oh, I'm. this is how it felt to write this character or this is what I feel is important. Like imagine you're watching it and think about what is the information presented? Like what do they understand at this point? What do they understand at this point? What's the audience experience? And be conscious of that and be uh, make choices to to be interesting. Like think about what you, what's really happening and what the audience thinks is happening and play around with that. Um, Decision to Leave is, uh, coming back to that film, what it does extremely well is it plays with subjectivity and placement of information, right? There's this whole sequence where he's, you know, on a stakeout, he's observing, um, you know, the girl who he's investigating, um, her name is Sore, and he imagines himself there with her, and they're intercutting sort of him solving other murders and the murder he's working on with her. There's a lot of, and then when he bring, when he starts asking her to work on cases with him, there's a lot of placement into like where he is in the, like where he is with her, like his consciousness, like where he is actually in the room. Like, is he actually in the room with her or is he imagining himself in the room with her while he's stalking her? Like there's a lot of subjectivity. There's a lot of, it's interesting from an audience point of view to think about what is really happening and what does the audience think is happening. Um, right. Yeah. 
I mean, and that was one of the ones like where you've seen it now twice, right? Yeah. I picked up a lot more the second time. Um, yeah. And I've only gone through the once and I feel like this is a film that's kind of meant to be watched more than once. That's that's my understanding of Decision to Leave is that it's really one where your first pass, you get an over, you get a sense of the story. And then the second time that you go through, you really, um, the second time you go through, you get to really appreciate the craft of it and all of these setups and payoffs. And at, before Adam and I hopped on here, we were talking a little bit about, um, we were talking a little bit about our choice to do this film with setups and payoffs. And what's interesting about it is that decision to leave is like a masterpiece and setups and payoffs as a director. So if we're looking at it as the story, it is, there's so many choices that the director made in setups and payoffs. Yeah. Like the, but, yeah, not, not to get too much into these. We really want to be it from a screenwriting point of view, but like, the the interrogation scene where um Hejun is in is interrogating her for the first time there's in how they stage the scene there is them interrogating each other and then there's a reflection there's a mirror behind them and then there's computer monitors where that we'd cut to but in each of the scene in each of the shots there's a conscious placement of who's in focus when is it the reflection that's in focused or is it them in the foreground in focus? And you, if you watch that scene again, you'll notice that their reflections are kind of like, rep, like when the reflections are in focus, they're kind of subconsciously connecting with each other outside of professionalism, right? But when they're in focus in the foreground, it's very surface level of, oh, she's speaking Chinese and he doesn't understand, she's in focus. Oh, he's speaking uh, Korean to her and she's trying to grasp along. She's out of focus. Oh, wait, they both have a moment of understanding together. They're all three of the four reflections are out of focus. And that's where it gets really interesting where you know that this isn't just an accident, that he would intentionally make her face out of focus. But all three, his, him and his reflection and her in the foreground are in focus on certain lines and moments. And it represents kind of like the choice, I forget exactly what it was, but I had this thought of, oh my God, that was the movie that hmm. she sees him, but he doesn't see her, you know, but he thinks he's seeing her because he's trying so hard to, he's trying to find clarity. He, because his whole, through the whole movie, he's trying to find solutions. He's trying to solve the unsolvable. He stays up at night, constantly searching for this. Um, and the move, the direction is constantly aware of their subconscious like state yeah, and is making movements and placements like there's a whole like i don't i i don't want to get too much into symbolism but this is just what's really interesting to me is that the whole film is about mountains and the ocean right she her family ha has a mountain that means a lot to her she kills her husband on a mountain as he's climbing she will climb it herself this there's a whole sort of visual motif of ascension and whenever he's pursuing a new lead whenever he's like in control of the narrative He's walking up. He's. Uh, you notice that every, there are multiple chase, chase scenes he makes with criminals, and every time he's climbing up the stairs, and when he's losing control, there's a descent down, and usually water is associated with the descent down. It's usually when he goes down to tie his shoelaces, and at the end of the film, he ties his shoelaces, and he's completely submerged in the sand and water, and earlier on, it's raining, and he ties his shoelaces, and there's water everywhere. He's descending, and even in the first shot of him, where, he's, uh, where we meet him in the shooting range the camera pans up with him like there's a sense of movement upward is control and him trying to see and understand and the descent the fall down the going down the mountain going down into the water is him losing control him trying to him losing everything right and there's uh and in the scene where he um again this is kind of drilling down almost like book report energy but like the director no was you find it interesting stuff. yeah the director no, cool. is in control of this stuff I, I don't think from a writing point of view that that stuff is really in the domain of the screenwriter um i wonder how much so that's that's kind of what i wanted to get into a little bit is how much of it is unfortunately we can't 
share the script. We don't have the script. We can't read it. It's in Korean, it, yeah. It's in Korean. Um, so we can't check. But I'm always curious when like really interesting choices like that are made, how much of it was the director? How much of it was like the cinematographer? How much of it was the writer I himself? A, I think it's a director cinematography thing. Um, mm -hmm. But the the right i also think the writing in this movie is extremely good like there's a real strong sense of um what is information what is the flow of information who has who knows what at what point right like that's all in the script and the subtext emotionally of their sort of him wanting her their rom their romantic sort of yearning for each other that's all stuff that's in the script right it's yeah. more i see it from a point of view like the the specific choices of images and sounds and how we hear them and what we see in those scenes that's a director thing like there's a like a, a lot of visual symbolism that i don't think was in the script again in the first interrogation scene there's a shot of um and i didn't pick this out i picked this up in researching about the movie after the fact and i was like oh my god that how did i miss that detail there's a shot of when they're eating their food together um their soy sauce packets on this on the uh on the uh, what's it called? The packaging of the food, and he has a his soy packet, is, soy sauce packet is unused and full, and hers is unused, and they're both facing the ocean, like the the a drawing of the ocean, and it's like that little shot of them and the, how they use the soy packets is like an image that almost feels like the last shot of them on the beach, and that's like stuff that, I mean, I love that stuff, but it's that that's that's the director in control of the information they're yeah. like making connections between images like um that's a thing you subconsciously would feel possibly um you wouldn't even pick up the first time um i picked up that the soy sauce packets were little fish and i was like that's pretty nice they're a little <laughs> i think fish. that's a common thing that's a common thing <laughs> in my mind although i was like that's cool i want that but there was a um, shot of it right like yeah and ideally, i do remember the shot though like right. for whatever whatever reason maybe it was, it was a the fish very maybe it was intentional insert. yeah yeah and like i did not know that but i did remember the shot when you told me about it before because i was like oh yeah that was emphasized um I feel like as as a writer, I know that in the past with my scripts, I've been really tempted to put in that kind of stuff. Like if I'm like, dang, you know, it'd be cool yeah. if I put the soy sauce packets in there and uh, she was all used up and was on like a, you know. And a lot I, of readers would be like, <laughs> what, what is this? Why, why are you showing us this? I know. Yeah. I know. And it's it's one of those things like where I feel like. What's that curve? I I'm having a day where I can't remember the names of things, but like, what's that curve you have, like where you feel like you're an expert, and then the you Dunning Kruger really... effect. Yes, that one. It's yeah. like I feel like as you get, as you're like learning about screenwriting and start to feel pretty confident, you're like, dang, I know what's up. I'm gonna put yeah. so much symbolism in my script. I'm gonna put all the mirror images. It's all gonna be there. And then later on, you learn like, I really need to focus more on the story yeah. than than all these like little details but that is something that like as i watch that it reminds me of writing my earlier scripts where i was just so into like putting in like secret stuff like ooh this is a symbol here and like you know choices that are interesting as a storyteller but are kind of like outside my domain as just the writer if i was writing and directing it would be a different story or but, if you're writing a novel yeah it's a little different. Um, but like, yeah, it's kind of exactly what you said. Like, when you first start to learn about screenwriting, there's an overconfidence. Um, yeah. You feel like, oh, I, this is all easy. I mean, I remember the first time I read like a story by Robert McKee. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just write 18 scripts this year. That'll be great. Um, they'll all be amazing. <laughs> and I won't have to rewrite them. Um, and uh, as I started to do more, I realized, oh, my God, this sucks. I, I hate this. And then eventually you gain actual competence over time. Um, but... Um, what was my point with that? I had a point. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. My I, brain the sound. I had a point. You know, it's it, it's just like it's part of the natural rhythm of of becoming a screenwriter or of mastering anything, right? It's oh, I remember what I was gonna say. What matters is telling a story as simply as possible, right? Yeah. And ideally, the story you're telling is emotional. It's moving. You don't need tricks. 
you don't need flashiness. You don't need the poetry on the page necessarily. You know, ideally, if the story itself is moving and you tell it simply and in a straightforward way with clarity, the effect will happen. Um, now, when actors, directors, set designers, cinematographers, they read the script, they're interpreting it, they take the simply told story, the structure, the, the, the bones of the whole thing, and they elevate it. They make interpretive choices, right? Like for me, all of that stuff that was so dazzling, uh, that was that was very engaging and visually the mezzanine scene, how, like how things were put together, um, it was the other artists elevating a simply told story, right? Um, not to say that the story is simple or that um, your stories have to be simple, but the screenplay should be clear, right? It should be, you shouldn't be obscuring it or making it like a literary document. You're creating a document to be interpreted by other artists. Right. Um, so don't get in their way. Exactly. And that that's what's kind of like amazing and I think drives a lot of people to want to be writer directors is they want to control all of it. Exactly. Um, which is totally valid. But you know, it's but it's true that you need to you need to be both to control it to that level or super famous. Really, it's it's the <laughs> it's one of those two, it's one of those two options to control it to that level. So I was thinking about decision to leave and what I felt to me was like my big takeaway. I mean, there was a lot of awesome stuff about it, but something that I really loved was how they how they externalized his internal experience. Um, and so if he was spying on her through the window, then we actually got to see him in the apartment with her, watching her and like studying her. And it was it was a really cool externalization of what was happening internally. And one example that I feel like could be applied maybe to other genres was when she he called her on the phone when it was like an, it was in the early film. She was at her work taking care of the lady and he called her to say, come in. And when she answered the phone, he was standing in the room talking to her. Um and I thought that, that was really cool. I was like, that's that's an interesting way to solve the phone phone call problem in films. Yeah. Um, and it made me think, like, could this be applied to other genres? Like, is there a way that this just kind of like works as a state, like as a way to handle phone calls in different genres? Um, phone calls are very boring in general. Yeah, that's like, typically how they're done. It's like, yeah, you've seen the split screen. You've seen the cut from one person, the cut to the other person. Um, I, I my takeaway is that it's about that the, the my takeaway from this film specifically is <clears throat> depending on deep you are in the subjectivity of the character, you can do stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, this film is so deeply in Hajin's point of view. It's so connected to his wanting to understand, him wanting to solve. He's a detective. He's solving the mystery, right? That seeing him entertain sort of being in her shoes, like like the like when he imagined her climbing up the mountain with the um, the other phone, right? Um, and when he finally realizes that, and like he sees it, like we feel like he's there watching her get yeah. ready. Um, but it only works because of how the story's set up and what he's doing and who he is, right? Like if he was just some stockbroker, it wouldn't make sense to do something like that. Like it's because right. he's, he's an investigator and he has kind of some boundary issues and he's like secretly wants to like insert himself into her, into her life from a voyeuristic point of view, because that's in the story you can, that's, this is the way you tell that story. Right. And at the end of the day, um, I think there's a famous quote, I think it's by Stephen Sondheim, but it's like, or uh, he, it's attributed to him. Style, the style should come from the substance of the piece, right? Like, or form should be dictated by like what it is, right? Don't like try and come up with like a, oh, we're gonna be jumping, we're, we're gonna be jumping into different point of view ships. We're going to have the characters standing and seeing each other if it doesn't come out of what it is, right? Like this is very much like a, a like a romantic, sorry, a de erotic detective crime film. Yeah. So those choices come from what the promise of the thing is. Uh, 
Absolutely. And I feel like for for this character, it makes a lot of sense that like he's like inserting himself into people's lives. So we get to literally see him inserted into people's lives. I thought it it's interesting and it was a little bit of a frustrating experience as yeah. an audience member because I was like, is he fine? Like when I see him in these things unfolding, is this the truth? Is he imagining this? Like for, in particular, that mountain scene where he was climbing and seeing her push him over the edge. I was like, is he seeing this in his head or is this me the audience member getting to see what truly happened as he goes back there. Like, is he meant to know? Is he not? Like, I think in that particular example, it was the first thing. It's him imagining he's doing it and he's imagining her do it as he's, he's imagining yeah. what really happened as it happened. And from the objective, as objective truth as we can get, it is it, what it, happened, yeah. right? Like it's, it's, he, he's made the discovery. Yeah. It's uh, like, it's like there was there was something interesting about the experience of not knowing if that was the truth or his experience. And there was also something that was honestly like kind of frustrating, like where I was like, I just wanted like what am what am I looking at? Like, is this his understanding? And I wonder if if that was just me kind of like missing cues that would have indicated that like this is always gonna be his I think it always his is head. in his head. I that, that was my interpretation of the film, but as yeah. you're Every film teaches you how to watch it, right? Right. <laughs> ideally, like, ideally speaking, right? Like, and a good director gives you, like, kind of the grammar to understand what the rules are of, like, okay, we're going to, like, he's, he, if he started introducing that type of weird subjectivity shots at the end of the film out of nowhere, that would be very confusing. But if you're going to do that, do it from the beginning. So the yeah. audience knows, oh, this is something this movie does. And these are the rules of this world. And this is how I'm going to experience the story. And if, sort of, for example, we shifted into her head, it would have broken everything. Oh, yeah. It's sort of like when you set up a voiceover or any other kind of, like, yeah, not unusual storytelling, telling, storytelling technique. I don't know why that's a tongue twister. But it's like when you set up anything like that, you you want to set it up early in the film so that when you use it later, it's not necessarily breaking form. Um and then, of course, sometimes people choose to break it on purpose. You might have a random voiceover in the middle, but yeah. you you do that with the understanding that this is going to be a jarring experience. For because the you're conscious of the audience experience of the film. You you're conscious of these are the rules I've taught them. Yeah. How to digest this in the beginning. And again, we're speaking through a directing lens somewhat right now, but like um, even a writer, you know, if you were going to incorporate flashbacks in a very conscious way about like this is the information and the way i present information to the audience in the beginning of the film you want to be consistent with the way you do that in the end mm -hmm. um so that's kind of the, the big takeaway from all of this in my point of view Chekhov's gun you know misdirection um is what does the audience know and when are you telling them like what is the information you tell them is it a right. promise that something's gonna happen did you put a gun in the drawer that information you've told them. Okay, when would be the most meaningful time to fulfill that promise? And when you do, what are you, how are you sort of obscuring it? How are you making it surprising but inevitable? That's the thing about all payoffs. If they aren't surprising, audience isn't gonna care. Right. They're gonna roll their eyes and be like, oh, saw that. You know, <laughs> that's but the the magic trick is to not just coming back to the Hitchcock thing blow up a bomb out of nowhere and shock people for no reason. The magic trick is to surprise people in a way that feels inevitable. That's the magic trick. If you can do that, you have an ending, you, you've got people. It's like, oh my God, I didn't know. I remember in the beginning of the film, the kid had the bike and the hearing aid or whatever it is, you know, like the, the, the audience machete. puts it together. The machete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, and even if it's a romance film, even if it's, um, even if it's an emotional line, like we were talking about in Toy Story, it's not fall, it's not flying, it's falling with style. That's a promise. It's a promise that's invisible to the audience. But when it comes back with new meaning, if they just said that line and it never, if they just said that line then, and they never had set up the different emotional context for that line, it would be completely hollow and meaningless. 
Yeah. Right. So think about what are the words characters are saying? How can you have the meaning? How can you have lo- certain lines rhyme emotionally with other lines and moments? How can you set up things that can pay off things? I'm rambling, but the main point is to be conscious of the audience experience and make intentional choices. Yeah. And then if something big is going to happen, I think you can almost work backwards because a lot of times things feel more rewarding as an audience member when like you said they feel inevitable that doesn't mean that they're predictable at all it means inevitable and so it's like if you're gonna have something big happening in this one part of your script if you have an explosion it's like how can i set that up in a way to um how can I set that up in a way where it feels inevitable, but is still surprising and is still unpredictable? So I think that that concludes that discussion, but now we can move to some Q and A's. Here is a good question. Adam, you might've been typing out. Oh, a, yeah, yeah, I have already. it. So, so would you see, um, Hitch, yeah, sorry, would you see Hitchcock's bomb under the table suspense building fall as falling under the category of setups and payoffs? So no, I wouldn't I wouldn't call that necessarily setup and pay payoff in really like a macro story sense, but it is information in the scene, right? And it's it's you're giving the audience information to create uh, suspense. But I would not call it like a from more of a the macro sense of unless unless you have like a ticking clock for like all of act three or something, right? Yeah. Um it's like it's information though. Yeah. It's it's I'd say it's connected, but it's not the exact same. Like it, it it's a pretty I see like a pretty straight con- connection between Chekhov's gun and Hitchcock's bomb in terms of like I'm going to show you something and then come back to it, but kind of as we discussed, they really are referring to two different things. The Hitchcock's bomb is really about suspense right? Yep. Like, it's it's really about building suspense, increasing tension in a scene. And it is a setup. But it's not, that's not the purpose of it. Like, it's like the Hitchcock's bomb under the table is really referring to the emotional experience that you're creating in the scene. It can be a Chekhov's gun. But I feel like oftentimes, Chekhov's guns are not typically written as obvious as a bomb under the table, right? Like, at least now, it's not that you see the gun and you immediately think, I'm going to, like, you are going to definitely use it. It's more like the audience sees it, clocks it, forgets it, and then we come back. The Hitchcock's bomb is we see it and we remember it the whole time, right? So it's, it's like, it's a different thing. Like, how much do you want the audience to remember it? And how much do you want it to just be recalled when the conclusion happens um so yeah and just uh, uh calling up to this comment exactly right so in everything everywhere all at once uh daniel's you know set up rakakuni <laughs> early on in the story it wasn't act one but it was early on in the story and then later on actually that why the whole act three had like cascaded all of the payoffs for all the different storylines that they'd set up all at once you know, from uh, the one character having an S and M dungeon that they discover in Act Two, you know, to the, you know, the the one guy from Act One who loved the smell of the perfume because it reminded him of his, of his wife. Like they paid off all of those lines through all the different characters that she encountered. Now, but they didn't do it in an unconscious way. It was motivated by the story. Her whole thing in that. The, her her whole moment there in the story is that she's it's it's her confronting all these different ways of like fighting with kindness etc right so rakakuni rakakuni i don't know how to say it but oh my god rakakuni 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 it well, was a fabulous choice well anyway uh thanks so much everybody for joining us today um yeah this was a good conversation and uh next week Next week, we are doing formatting. We're looking at screenplay formatting, particularly as it applies to writing a spec script, blacklist competition, stuff like that. We're looking at the kind of formatting that can help you uh, stand out and get read and get attention as a spec script um, entering contests. So 
we are very excited about that. Fantastic. And we will see you then. Bye, Adios. everybody.